The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. Well, when I started running, I suppose I didn't stop, and when I got the chance to go, I said I should go, and so I opened up. We were only the small little fish out there, so we are, and uh, we're trying hard to make it through. But it's hard to get the breaks when you're the smaller fish. Because I love this county so much, you know, and it's just, I'm delighted that the lads, the lads did it for the people of Walford today, because, like, I, I'm, har- I'm heartbroken. <laughs> Welcome along to the GAR. This is the Hurling Show on a Thursday. Michael and Cheddar are here with me in the studio. Um, lads, quarter finals. There's only five big games of hurling left in the whole championship. That's a little bit sad. So we have two huge hurling games this weekend. We have two semi finals on a Saturday and a Sunday. We've only three more weekends. We have five big games. <laughs> really make you sad. Just three more big weekends of hurling. Like, I mean, it's a weird one. And there are some permutations um, based on who wins this weekend so if Kilkenny win they're going to play Cork in the semi-final because a repeat of the provincial finals is not allowed and if Limerick win they'll play Galway irrespective of the Clare Wexford result as Clare have already played Cork um, while Galway have already played Wexford so if you can get your head around all that it took me to read it a few different times so basically if Kilkenny win they're playing Cork if Limerick win they'll play Galway that's all you need that's kind of what you need to know so I didn't really know that I thought that kind of stuff might have counted earlier in the qualifiers but not necessarily coming through to a semi-final Yeah we've been spoiled rotten Woolly up to date uh, the Horn Championship this year has been absolutely brilliant the format's been brilliant they tweak a few things next year like the break to play two games have a week off and play two but apart from that I think the whole championship has been, been a huge success yeah uh, it's a pity now five games left we're going to miss it we'll have to watch some of the football next yeah, few weeks but they should spread it out though shouldn't they because there's two quarters and two semis like I mean put yeah. them on separate week. I, that's what I would do like I mean it's sad that there's only three weekends left of hurling and you're talking about two huge games on the same weekend Cheddar like I mean I don't know like there must be a like we we want the championship condensed but at the same time playing off two huge hurling games on the same weekend when you've only got five games left seems like a bit of a waste yeah I suppose first of all it's hard to believe that there is only that number of games left you know when earlier on in the year we were saying there was going to be a huge amount of games this year and uh, we probably have gone through you know a lot of fantastic games and and uh, we are where we are now really at the knockout uh, stage at the championship um, I suppose there's another side to that Willie as well even if you take this weekend uh, there's one quarter final in Cork on the Saturday and another one in Turles the following day on the Sunday um, I, I I know an awful lot of hurling people that would go to both of those matches um, so now you're probably going to you know spend two days going to two games um, and you know there, there's a fair argument for having both games on the one day maybe in Parky Keeve or something like that and you know and, and make the one day out of it yeah. so probably you know what you're saying is right um, in terms of promoting the game having them on separate days you know a proper lead up we're, we're in really really serious hurling now a proper lead up to one of these games but on TV properly promoted and all that individually for each game would be brilliant um, but on the other side of that a lot of people like to go to all of the games and you know certainly this weekend you'd be thinking of you know will I travel down to Cork stay overnight and, and uh, come on to Turles on the following day and catch two games that sounds uh, like a plan to me Cheddar it, it does but I suppose <laughs> That's all right for for, for you know <laughs> nut cases about hurting <laughs> ourselves. Um, I but, already you know, got warned on all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, Michael, and that, like you know, for for a family and all of that, that yeah. is quite expensive, obviously, and and uh, even just no, the time. No, you're going that. on your own now. Let's <laughs> let's not get this all messed up. Well, m- well maybe that be could be good reason for having matches on days like that. Uh, but look, look on a serious note, um, it's difficult to get these things right. I do agree with Michael. Um, it has been a brilliant championship. I think we fell on this. It was a knee jerk re- reaction. I think more than pre planned, uh, but n- n- you know, n- n- no more than anything else, you've got to test these things and trial them out in year one, and then try and fix them for year two. I think there's some things that need to be fixed to make it an even better championship uh, f- for next year. Uh, but so far, it's been brilliant, and, and you know, I've no doubt that from here on in, the games are going to be fantastic games as well. Yeah. But bear in mind, that, you know, the reason that the championship has been good. Um, has been a little bit to do with structure, but it has been more to do with that. There's a, a you know all of the teams are very evenly balanced at the mm. minute, so we've got great games. You could have the very same championship and have a number of bad games, and then it just seems it's a poor championship at that stage. We've been lucky that in this year um, there hasn't, with the exception maybe of Galway and Tipperary, and bear in mind Tipperary gone out of it now. There hasn't been a leading team like the Kenny dominated it for ten or fifteen years. If that had been the case, maybe this championship you know mightn't be as dynamic as as it is at the minute. Yeah, no, that's true, and there was no dead rubbers at all in months 
Munster like I mean and maybe with Dublin having improved in Leinster next year it'll be even better um, in Leinster just on the point of the two games being played on different days um, Clare people are complaining about having to go down to Parky Cueve Wexford people are complaining about going to Parky Cueve I think Wexford have a much uh, better argument yeah. Like, I mean, I was looking at the times even from uh, from Ennis to Cork is an hour and 58 minutes, from Ennis to Turles is an hour and 28 minutes. So that's only a half hour difference. There's nothing really to be complaining about. Parky Keeve's a lovely pitch. But Wexford were sent down there last year to play um, Waterford and they're being sent down again this year. And the, uh, Wexford's argument is that why can't they get uh, a neutral venue in a Leinster yeah. venue rather than playing the Munster teams down in the Munster venues? Yeah, that's fair enough. Hopefully, like, Nolan Park could be there to fantastic venue to play the game yeah and, and yeah. actually just just on that it's nearly three hours from Wexford to Cork so they are like I mean it's yeah. a longer travelling time and they've done it have to do it two years in a mm. row and uh, and sorry to cut you off again in 2014 2016 they played all around quarter finals and one was in Limerick and the other was in Semple Stadium yeah. or it was in Semple Stadium so they've been asked four times to go to Munster for a quarter final instead of like you say Nolan Park or somewhere and bring one of them up here definitely sure you look at the Leinster final being brought to Munster it seems to be a <laughs> knee jerk reaction like if there's any games in doubt it's going to go to somewhere in Munster you know and you definitely feel for Wexford uh, I don't think they'll use it as an excuse after Woolly Wood. I know. Um, it's definitely tough. And plus, Clare have more experience playing down there. You know, they'd be playing there a lot more than, than Wexford would have in the past. Well, so. Parky Keeve maybe no, you know. Like, yeah. I mean, it's so new that they wouldn't really... And Wexford yeah, well, played there yeah. last year. So I don't think that excuse... It's more for supporters maybe even having to drag them down. Yeah. Um, look, I, just, I, I don't know. I'd have no argument about the distance, lads, to be honest with you. If I was a Wexford fan or a Wexford player, I'd walk to Peninsula Island. I'd have to play this game, to be honest with you. Um, so look, I have no argument about that. There's a little bit of a, a, all right about um, you know having to maybe travel to the opposition. But look, Cork is as far away from Clare, I guess, uh, you know, as as Wexford. There's is. not much in it. Yeah. You're not going to get you know Thurles is obviously is the obvious uh, yeah, mid game, but there's a game on the following day there, and you've got to spread them around a little bit as well. And I'm sure Cork County Board are fairly are fairly strong in making sure that they get games for their new stadium and that as well. And rightly so, I have no I have no argument about that. So look, I'd have no uh, I'd have no argument about about distance at this stage of the championship look you'd walk you'd walk to the game to play it if you got the chance um, I'm sure there's a whole host of other counties would just love that chance and are not going to get it incidentally I'll just make one comment about last Sunday with the Leinster final played at a Munster venue won by a Connacht team um, so I'm the I'm, world's I'm, gone mad uh, <laughs> the world's gone mad but um, you know I'm looking to the future a little bit here as well and, and I'm saying look are we are we really into yeah. open trial territory now at this stage number one yeah. and number two is there a need anymore for provincial councils because at the end of the day provincial councils have held up this maybe more than any any other organisation within the GA yeah. and we have a number of steps I suppose in the organisation that I'm not so sure that we need anymore and this game proved it in my view um, and you know I think that's certainly something that we'll, we'd like to look at and the expense that's uh, that's spent on councils could be put into full-time coaches and a lot of these councils I don't know whether we need them anymore last Sunday proved it didn't yeah no I agree completely I think they're absolutely holding up any change and the only people that sees provincial championships as valuable are the provincial councils mm -hmm. because that's obviously they're admitting that they're not needed if, yeah. they, if they don't anyways John Conlon lads I missed this interview it was on the independent with Dermot Crow and he's talking about his stomach and his diet and it was very interesting at the start of the interview he said a nutritionist came on board this year at the player's request and there are signs of this new learning um, everywhere so I don't know like I mean he's not exactly specific about that there wasn't a new nutritionist before but it is said that a nutritionist came on board this year at the player's request so I don't know would I read into it that they hadn't been there under Davy, which maybe Davy's old school and didn't go down that road but anyway John Conlon used to be a bit of an obsessive about hurling and it's about that and it's a really good interview but when he starts talking about food um, it, it gets really interesting he says personally I would have always seen myself ha as having a good diet but the nutritionist made me go off and do a test on how my digestion was working as she described it I had an A class diet but I got a C class grade out of it there were problems with my di digestive system often in matches I'd feel very bloated I can kind of relate to that maybe feeling a bit bloated like I mean mm. geez, I remember when Mick O'Dwyer would eat a fry before a match in Crow Park in the red cow <laughs> like you wouldn't feel bloated after a fry yeah, but you'd yeah. be sucking on the bottle of water there all right like I mean but that was back in the good old days like but even feeling bloated after the pasta like you're just basically eating as much as you can and getting it on board but what he's done what the nutritionist has told him to do I just thought it was amazing so he stopped eating red meat he's cut out bread and milk he doesn't drink tea 
much anymore. So he eats fish, he eats a lot of fish and chicken, and he blends all his food. My God, lads, what's the point in living? You're blending all your food. All your food is a milkshake, a milkshake <laughs> of chicken and fish. I don't know, lads, if I have to give up an all-star to be able to eat a steak and yeah. not blend all my food, I, I'm, I'm really taking that option. I wouldn't lie, will you? I couldn't do it. So this <laughs> thought would kill me. Well, you can't have an ice bath. Never mind, give up a steak. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sound so unprofessional. The dietitians, I used to hate them. I hate them. Like, uh, you'd meet them, have a word with them. But I did whatever, again, what worked for me and I think dietitians are there they're great if individuals work out what works for them it's great but again when it comes to meal time for teams <laughs> you can't have 30 different meals coming out you know and certain lads would bring their own food by the time I left the panel there was about 10 lads gluten free you know that was the new thing right. you know, everyone's gluten free and I feel great now but um, I, I struggled with chicken and pasta with no sauce you know just the thoughts of blending food to me but it's worked he's in the best condition I've ever seen him yeah. he hasn't lost any of his muscle mass but he still looks a bit leaner you know and um, if it's worked for him on the pitch, even if it's a placebo thing and, he, and he, it makes him hurl better, it, I'm all for it, you know. Yeah. But well, I he, couldn't do it, definitely no, not. <laughs> but like, is John, John Conlon started doing this year, Cheddar. And look at John Conlon this year. This <laughs> is an ad advertisement for listening to your nutritionist. And if uh, she tells you to blend your food, blend your food, I don't know what is. Um, yeah, but look, first of all, it's an area that I'm not qualified in. So, you know, what I'm going to say here is just general, I suppose, for general discussion, really. Um, this is a very, very serious area. Um, and it's not necessarily nu nutrition. Um, the nutritionist should be speaking to the strength and conditioning coach, and uh, all of them should be speaking to the hurling coaches and, and all of that. It's just, it's just a circular thing, really, um, and it is hugely important. And you know, if you were talking about high performance, you kind of decide I'm just going to be high performance in my hurling. It is your total, it's total lifestyle high yeah. performance, and it's all, it's all about sleep. It's all about re rest and recovery, and it's all of those things together. All of, all of those things might only give you one percent of an edge. But if there's 10 of them, that's 10% of an edge. And even the, even the thing about um, you know eating the type of food you eat before a match, when you eat it, fuel up properly for the game. I remember when I was playing, I'd, I'd eat maybe at 7 or 8 in the morning. It would be minuscule stuff. Um, of com course, completely wrong. We didn't know any different at the time. Now it's that's all measured down to minutes. Um, and even what you would eat before the game in the dressing room and what you would eat at half time in the dressing room specific to player um, is where you need to go and if you're not in that how can a manager uh, speak to his players and tell them we're in high performance environment now when they know from, from listening to other players that you're not um, so I think I'm not surprised I'm, I'm surprised that uh, John has brought up this because I would have thought he was in high performance ter territory for a number of years um, but it is hugely important and it's, it's specific to player and look we know in society that an awful, an awful lot of people um, you know might have different different dietary problems and, and you know we know all about those things so what suits me may not suit you will you may yeah. not suit you Michael um, so it's hugely important that this is a one to one with nutritionist or dietitian whichever um, and that you know exactly the right food to eat that's going to work for you to fuel you up and I do agree with Michael it is specific to player um, and look th here's what actually happens here you're you know, you may need to teach your players how to cook. We're in a very different society now. And certainly when I was playing, um, I know I knew as little about cooking as I know now, which is about probably b about comes as far as maybe boiling an egg. <laughs> um, but an awful lot of, uh, nearly all of the players now cook. That's the society we live in. So, you know, you need to be able to cook the right food. Here, here's where this has gone to. Um, you may very well be a player or go into uh, go into a shop or, or go into a supermarket and you're taking pictures of the food that you'd like to eat and knocking them down the line to your nutrition or dietitian and you're asking his advice on these different things so as you want to go home and cook it. That's the level we're at. Yeah. And if you're not at that level in a team where you're saying, I am high performance here and my, man my management style is all about high performance and you might be doing that in other areas. If you're not doing it in diet and nutrition uh, and allied to the proper strength and conditioning and so on and so on, you're not in high performance my view yeah I, I would agree like um, I mean it's gone that far he's cutting out peppers tomatoes and things that he loves because they weren't agreeing to his stomach so I think he might be on a different scale in that he has a sensitive stomach and like he said on match day I'd be burping I used to eat the pre-match meal now I bring my own lunchbox I think loads of lads are the same I thought my diet was good I was into baking and cooking so he actually knew about good food not sh it, but it wasn't for him so like I mean I'd say he was high performance he just didn't know about this stom sensitive stomach mm. ma ma yeah. maybe that he and had and I might come in there w w Wooly there's a huge amount of bullshit if you'll forgive me 
written about this by an awful lot of people that know nothing about it, and that's why I, I'd refuse to comment on the details of it. You were talking about expert people here advising players, not some person on a blog or something like that with no expertise or experience in this area. Generally speaking, nutritionists that are involved with teams are highly qualified and highly experienced in, in, in sports nutrition, not necessarily lifestyle nutrition, but sports nutrition. Um, so you were talking to experts here advising you on, on, on what you should do specific to your, your yeah. body. Um, so I think that it's very d- important to actually recognise that. I remember we were on a bus down to Limerick to play under 21 all Ireland final against Kerry. It was in 1998 and we're all eating Mars bars on the bus because <laughs> there was a box of Mars bars handed back because in our heads back then when you're innocent, yeah. sugar equals yeah. energy. Yeah. So get that chocolate in tea. Like, get yeah. that chocolate in tea. And we're sitting there eating Mars bars. Uh, but your body doesn't break no, that down absolutely. fast enough. So it's actually stupidity. Yeah. You know, but like, I mean, it, it was naive stuff when you think back to the 90s and early 2000s it was really naive kind of stuff like even the idea yeah. that we'd have a fry yeah. in the Red Cow Hotel before a, a Leinster final yeah. in front like, of I mean, <laughs> and there's no problem with that like I mean you know and yeah. that's so one dietitian I met well, well he said to me so I had to meet them up and I, I was like right come on I said to me would you snack much and I said look I go to bed late I wouldn't go to bed at 11 or 12 and uh, she said I, I'd probably snack then after dinner at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock and she's like would you not think of anything better that you could do with have your wife <laughs> <laughs> yeah would you not think you could burn a few calories within 8 and 12 <laughs> so I went home and said we're going to stand stand across the head <laughs> I said I'm only following instructions <laughs> <laughs> so you want to pass the phone oh, yeah you? exactly do you, the, do you want the number <laughs> oh. well that's the one of the best ones <laughs> I've ever heard <laughs> no, she's no, even no. with a good reason <laughs> like that you're not <laughs> it didn't help anyway did you <laughs> No, th- like th- th- there's a huge amount in this. Uh, you know, Michael is just reminding me of something here because I because kn- I, I I know where Michael was coming from when he was playing. Um, you know, you could be on, you could be working at nights. You could have, you could be working nights one week, uh, days the next. Your body clock has changed. This is where the real expertise comes in and being able to advise you about you know situations like that that are you know outside of the norm where you know you will really need, really need expert advice about how to fuel up and how to properly recover in these areas. And you know, look at the players. You know, you 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 are. You are short selling your players if, if you're if you're not doing these things for them, in my view. Yeah, exactly. And I often found when I was tra- commuting down from Dublin that I'd eat a big dinner at one. I'd get a carvery because I know, mm. and then but then I wouldn't eat until training because I'd be driving home from work, and the only opportunity I'd have would be maybe stopping in a petrol station and getting a bloody muffin, or, you mm. know, something. Yeah. And that's not doing me any good. So you're actually going from one until nine without eating, yeah. which is not what they tell you yeah. to do either. So you have to get into a habit of of. Uh, like packing a lunch and eating mm. that in the car. Like yeah, it's absolutely. difficult to stay disciplined and that kind of stuff. I like I found it pretty difficult. Anyways, we'll, we'll have to move on from that one. Joe Canning could be in hot water, lads. I'd like to get your opinions on this because he used a Red Bull towel to dry his hurl. Mm. Now, lads using towels to dry their hurls isn't unusual in really hot weather, but like he used a Red Bull one. Uh, this could be an innocent mistake. A towel could have gone missing. We know Red Bull are aggressive marketers. We've had Ashley Thompson on yeah. the show here and she'll wear a Red Bull hat, a Red Bull top. You know what I mean? So yeah. Red Bull definitely get their, their clients um, to get them out there. So I don't know if Joe did this on purpose um, or if Joe did this, there could be a scenario in the, in the dressing room where he just pulls up a towel and it's the wrong one and then it's out there and he's not thinking, whatever. Anyways, there's two sides of what could have happened. But there's a rule of this, lads, and, and it states that the only sponsorship permitted uh, to be displayed on match day are those carried on a team's jerseys and training gear, which in Galway's case are Supermax and Papa John's, as well as kit manufacturers O'Neill's. The penalty for breach of this rule mm. is disqualification and or loss of expenses for a team and suspension of not less than 24 weeks or to the expulsion for individuals. Um, like yeah, uh, over the top. It's over the top, really, isn't it? Mm. Like, I mean, funnily enough, we were uh, the this came in from because of our sponsors, Paddy Power, who put Paddy Power on, on Sean Oga Halpin's <laughs> hurl back in two thousand and four. Yeah. So the the GA cut this out because obviously, like the bloody darts or anything, you could have a ten sponsors down along your hurley. It would yeah. be fairy tale stuff. <laughs> but uh, they did they cut this out. But like, there is a rule there in the book. Like, it, they're not going to. Do, they're not going to suspend Joe or probably throw a book at Joe. Like, I mean, it's the player of the year. I don't yeah. think it's going to happen. I think no. Joe might have to explain himself, though. Would that be fair? Yeah, look, I'd say he'll explain it as an innocent mistake. I doubt it was. It was probably a quick publicity stunt. Um, they've got they've got all the media talking about it now, so it's done and dusted. Will you? I don't think it would be an issue going forward. People are talking about Red Bull. Joe's job is done, and it's like, it'll be swept under the carpet now. Like, the GA be mad. They'd be lynched if they did anything about it. You know? Yeah. 
I just think like there's not many people that get that huge sponsorship. Joe tried the chances are there to tell and that's it now. You know, I don't think I don't think they yeah, move on. I think exactly, you know? I think it's a story move on, but then again it's Joe Canning and you can't really move you yeah. have you have to talk about it, which yeah. is what this we'll yeah. call it this drinks company. We won't give them what they <laughs> give them what they want. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think um, when it's a player um, and it's the first time, you know, you know let's be straight here. Yeah. Everybody knew what was going on there. Here, sorry, Joe, and look, I, I'll qualify that, but then I have massive uh, time for the man. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, he might make a, make a, a couple of euro out of it and that, and look, no, and there's nobody going to disagree with that. But just think of the other side for a minute. Everything is fine until something conflicts with your main sponsor, and then it's a serious issue. Um, so you, the GA do need to be careful about this. You know, they're they're going to some companies, and that this may very well be a county board. This may be some somebody conflicting with sponsors of the Galway team, and uh, Joe will be getting something individual out of this. But it's, it may very well conflict with you know whoever their main sponsor is. Um, and you know, you need some controls over these things. In this instance, I don't think there is, and I don't expect any issue to be made out of it other than a slap in the hand. Don't do it again. Um, but I, I, I can understand the reasons for it and I think it's probably maybe more to do with teams maybe you know as you say well you just plastering their jersey with different things there's certain rules around that I think you can only have two uh, sponsors uh, adverts on your jersey front and back as far as I'm aware um, so other than you know I, I, I think in this instance um, clearly Joe knew what he was doing uh, clearly it you know, it's it helps um, his brand and his market and his image and all of that. Um, I think it'll be a slap in the hand, but I can understand why the rules are there and why they're so stiff. They, because as I say, look, in the worst case scenario, if you know you promoted something that conflicted with your with your team sponsor, who is you know committing a lot of funding to your team, well, look, that's not the place that the GA wants to be in. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. We'll move on from that. A quick one here, lads, because Jerry Aylward took seventeen steps. I counted <laughs> last week when he scored the goal. <laughs> And it's two things in the game of hurling that are not just policed. And one is steps and the other is hand passing. Mm. So our lads are getting away with throws from as far as I can see. Like they can't be clear double actions. Like, I mean, they're doing it so fast that referees are just turning a blind eye to it. And the steps are having a, tur- a blind eye turn to it as well. So there's a website called hurlingtalk.com and they analysed the interpretation of the steps rule over one game. So it was Limerick Tipperary in the Munster Championship, right? So on 49 occasions, according to their analysis, the ball was overcarried yeah. in this game, right? So that's anything over four steps, which we know is what's permitted. So only one free was awarded for these 49 occasions of overcarrying. Now, they did a breakdown. So five steps, there was 11. You're just one over. Six steps, 23. Seven steps, eight. Eight steps, four. Nine steps, one. 10 steps one and 11 steps one. There was one mm. free given for that. So you could forgive the 11 is five. You're getting into dodgy territory <laughs> at the 23 six. But like, it's just whatever it is, um, <clears throat> lads, it's almost like, and it's the same in football. When you're tackled and you break free of the tackle, yeah. it's almost like you're allowed your four after that. When you, you, you might use four riding the tackle. You yeah, know that? You take into account, Willie, some of them that if, if it's a free, if a fella's fell on the man who has the ball and then the man breaks away, a ref won't blow it. So, do you know, like he might say, he mightn't give advantage, he mightn't wave advantage, so it wouldn't be a free other way, but he's saying, I'm letting him off taking six, seven steps. Because he's out there being failed, breaking a tackle, and then he's throwing the ball up. A lot of them might account for that. But the main thing is around the square, like backs and forwards have a license there. Like if a back normally has a license to slap a bit more and get away with it anywhere around the goals. And a forward. <laughs> smiling there. And a forward has the opposite. Like if he's getting failed, he's normally granted a few more steps. Now there's a few more steps, make maybe seven or eight. But 17 is ridiculous. Like it was obvious. I know he got failed twice yeah. within that within them steps, but it should have been a free twice. Yeah. Like you know. But is it not? If, like was the Elward one not the most obvious case? Because he didn't even play the ball. No. Better. Like it's not no. like you can even <laughs> cheat, and he didn't even pretend to play the ball once in 17 steps. The worst of all of that was he kicked the ball again. They kicked it. Yeah, <laughs> which should be outlawed, right? <laughs> um, uh, I, I look. I, I think there's sort of swings around about in this. You'll see this. Um, you know, you'll, you'll you'll see this happening. We'll say one year, and then next year it's something else. Um, and look, managers and coaches do tell players to do this. I tell them tell our own players, and, and you'll see this a lot in the possession game, particularly from defenders coming out of the defence, because you're trying to break out the open field. You're also trying to break away from ta- the tackle zone. Um, so you might have a wing back. He g- grabs the ball. He sprints forward to try and get out of the tackle zone, or to try and um, a- American wing forward to be able to pop a pass to his colleague coming out of the defence. 
and they're really really going at speed here and you know to take a fair referee to count them to be honest with you yeah, th- these are sprinting players now so you take you take um um, any of the wing backs at the minute when they grab the ball they absolutely motor out to midfield to try and get into open territory to be able to distribute intelligent ball into the forwards um, so the possession game I suppose and I always uh, um, you know I love that game in terms of just don't give away the ball but it does attract a little bit of you know carrying the ball too much now let's get back to Ger Elbert like you know look there's no excuse for that one um, you wouldn't uh, need a, a calculator to, to count those steps as such and it clearly should have been either a free in which I think it should have been or maybe a penalty or a free out um, and I think in situations like that given the advantage um, you know you like to see given the advantage and I think the forwards deserve the advantage in, in these areas and Michael might disagree with me in this one um, but I think he deserves the advantage but I think there are a time comes when the advantage just looks silly and running yeah. 17 steps with the ball is silly in my view um, and look it was uh, uh, incidentally I just thought that the referee in, in that game you know I, I, there, I think the referee in overall this year is not of the standard of a number of years ago and I'll make one other comment on that I was at the game um, why you would need to go to Hawkeye for freeze or for shots at goal that's directly in front of the goal and you need to turn around and call Hawkeye in situations like that I think if you cannot see that that's a point or a wide you shouldn't be an umpire to be honest with you um, so I, I think there was a couple of things in that there was a couple of frees I thought missed in that game as well Willie, um, particularly on Connor Whelan I think going through there was a very same free the other side I was given to Kilkenny after that I'm not saying that the referee was favouring Kilkenny I'm not saying that at all uh, but there was just maybe um, a misapplication of some rules in that game that I you know I think you know shouldn't have happened yeah okay fair enough and would you think the hand pass is being taken advantage of or you think no I don't think so uh, Willie I think you know if you had the I don't know who you'd need here to, to to, to actually ad- adjudicate and there's probably some engineers or something like yeah. that but no I think the hand pass generally speaking is done so quickly now it, yeah. I- it is it is done properly in the majority of instances you know much more I think than, than it isn't um, I, don't, y- I don't think that's an issue at the minute years ago like for me not I haven't played hurling but mm. years ago they ma- used to make it so much more obvious now maybe they're just letting it a second well, see, now, you're, now you're attacking the hand would you like I know whenever I was marking a forward if you, I know he's going to hand pass with that so I have there I have his elbow most of the time or even if he attempts to pop it up you hit his elbow and it, it changes the hand pass completely so lads right. have to get it way quicker now like, yeah, so yeah. you don't want that big movement it's literally like out and in like, you know, you don't even have to move your arm you can do it with your hand yeah and so that, it, that's probably even more difficult than steps to call for a ref absolutely. how does he know that it, for that split second it hasn't left yeah, the and, and his back is like he won't be able to see it most of the time like if a ref's behind me and I'm doing that how is he meant to see that like I could yeah. easily get away with it like, and it's a very tough one for refs to call for me like you know. Okay, uh, and I think um, you know I'd agree with Michael on that. Um, you know, a lot of times he's unsighted on it, so he just has to take it on trust, really. But otherwise, not you'd be blowing, you'd be blowing very regular. Um, but I think the hand pass technique has improved so much as well. I mean, how many times have we seen players? Uh, hand passing the ball backwards I, I've never seen that in hurling it's not that I've never seen it I'm sure that players didn't have the ability to do that you see it regularly now you know accurate hand passing going backwards he's going away from the play oh, and the underhand pass, one yeah. the underhand pass so it just tells you that the technique and hand pass and look it has to be good because you know the hand pass is so important in you know moving the ball between the lines up the field it's so important that you get that right and that you weight it properly to the player coming on to the run so clearly players are, are, are practicing it an awful lot more and it, and it has become an awful lot quicker but I think um, I think it's probably done properly in most occasions Right okay just to finish up before we get into the matches lads um, former Carlo hurling captain James Hickey has had a few things to say and um, he's putting his neck on the line to say the least so um, we know Carlo's rising but whether it has risen this far as James Hickey thinks it has well that's uh, we'll have to see <laughs> how they fare out against Offaly next, ju- next year because uh, James Hickey said I think this was after the Limerick game he said on the local radio Carlo are a 10 points better uh, better team than Offaly and I've no problem saying that I like the way he <laughs> says that and I've no problem saying that you see Westmead holding Wexford and Wexford only ran away at the end and I look and I think uh, too that the Joe McDonough Cup winners um, having play Limerick sorry I'm not reading that well he's kind of he does make a fair point that the Joe McDonough Cup winners arguably played the better team between Limerick and Wexford but like I mean how do you how do you judge that re- realistically but the point that they're 10 points better than Offaly like James um, I don't know what he's smoking yeah, it's, a cur- it's a careless comment because I don't see what good it does Carla Horling because it'll put them under pressure next year playing the b- biggest rivals in Offaly and 
like, I know it's shown confidence in what he believes in Carlo Hurland, but I think it does more damage than good to the team because more questions be asked of them now, a bit more pressure beyond them ne- next year to perform, and I just I don't see what good comes of that. Yeah. Comment, but if he if he said if he said it after winning the Joe McDonough Cup, you might understand. Yeah. But after <laughs> being walloped by Liverpool, it might not have been the an opportune yeah. time to be saying it. Like yeah. awfully, funnily enough, you can't ever judge one team against another team, no. but awfully actually do very well against Limerick yeah. uh, traditionally but 10 points better he's probably losing a run of himself Cheddar um, ah, yeah, no, I think I think James set himself up there you know badly for next year and you know I think he should have been advised better in terms of what to say and all of that um, incidentally if the game was played tomorrow um, I'd probably think Carlo would beat Offaly now I don't think he'd beat him at 10 points uh, but Offaly, or Carlo certainly are improving a much improved team this year under Colm um, both in the style and the method of play, in the unity in their team, and also a really important point in their discipline. But I think the gap between, you know, Offaly are, are where they are, and I've spoken about them, you know, previously on the show, Billy, and people know my views on it. Um, but the gap now between Offaly, Carlo, and all the, the other Joe McDonough teams to the top teams, and Wexford, whether you like it or not, are a top team at the minute, including Clare and all of those teams. That gap is very big, and it's getting wider. Yeah. And and we may very well have and we may very well have and I don't want to keep going back to this point what the GA want um, a sub competition for in their view um, you know sub counties that they can play among themselves um, and then the elite competition for elite teams but the gap is getting wider and you know if James said that uh, that you know we were unlucky last Sunday and we, you know next year we'll beat Limerick by ten points well then I'd say he was he was definitely smoking something. <laughs> um, well. James, James is uh, he's fond of the limelight because James, James Hickey kind of rang a bell with me when I read it and I says where's James Hickey James Hickey Who's your, that's your man out of the <laughs> AIB ad that's on there <laughs> when the club championship starts every year and I've spoken about him on the football show so this is James Hickey who obviously oblivious to, to the to the cameras in the dressing room obviously just doesn't want any limelight in this at all so he's talking about getting to Croke Park and I want to be in Croke Park more than anything else in the world or whatever and he's got passion and everything and this uh, is yeah, well, well, well you look let's, let's, let's look at it in a different light here um, it'd be a very boring uh, dressing room and, and GA and that if we didn't have characters like James Hickey and look he, he said what he said and, and, and uh, it got people talking and, and um, look in the cold light of day um, you know there's an awful lot of Offaly people are going to be playing Carlo next Sunday and they'll use that obviously as you know some little bit of motivation um, and so on and so on but we need a couple of characters in ah, the GA as well yeah, and to a call bit, a spade bit, a bit of fun and a yeah. bit of cracking yeah. as well and so. like I mean even James Hickey put his neck on the block there I don't mind it. Like it's, mm. a, it's a silly statement but if you don't have some people being silly and yeah. throwing things out there yeah. then it will be a boring world it'll be a monotic. but anyways James Hickey and that speech in the dressing room <laughs> that we all that we all see and I've grown to hate it so much because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's it's ever and then after maybe year three or four I realised here hang on a second that lad's not even starting and he's <laughs> making it <laughs> but I think maybe he was pushed Passion. on in years and he had been a regular yeah. starter so listen we'll leave you with uh, James Hickey's great speech he gets into the foundry for free for life <laughs> <laughs> alright here it is if we genuinely genuinely believe that we're going to win today we will win I am 100% convinced we will win I am 100% convinced. Do not let yourself down today, lad. I want to go to Pro Park on Paddy's Day. I want to more than anything in the world. Come on! Come on, come on. Right, lads, we'll start with Kilkenny and Limerick. And I don't know, lads, this is a hugely difficult game for Kilkenny. Like, I mean, a six-day turnaround. We've seen this in provincial 
um, finalists losing in football to the point where they have to do away with make forcing them to go out six days later. I've lost the Leinster final replay against Westmead myself and we went out against Tyrone the qualifiers and we thought we were right. We said all the right things during the week and we got hammered. Mm. Now Tyrone were better than us at the time but not, not by the amount that they hammered us by. It's the demoralisation of being hammered like or being beaten in the provincial final. Two Sundays in a row cheddar in baking hot heat. Then you have, you're playing a team like Galway who are physically huge men. You're taking those hits. Like Kilkenny's bodies must be in an awful kind of way. Like can they turn this around? Um, well I'll answer your last question first Willie yes I think they can actually turn it around and I think what's important in things like this is your recent past history and the confidence in your team and in your management and in your county and that and that, that would count a lot in, in situations like this and I think the way they finished the last day in terms of really pulling a game that was you know well gone from them out of the fire um, would be a good I suppose psychological place to start off from now the physiological part of it is definitely tough and uh, you know there's 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 really clear evidence this year that any of the teams that played two games on the third Sunday, even though you know yeah. you would think the teams train for this and all of that, and that you know that the rest and recovery and all of this is so professional now that it's akin to playing you know it's akin to playing Premiership in the U in the UK. Uh, but clearly those teams did suffer but I think you'd, you'd, you'd rather than just making a blank blanket comment on something like that you'd need to look at all of the matches what were all of the conditions and the circumstances by which teams played bad, badly on the following day you know in Watford's case it may very well have been injuries sendings off or something like that you'd need to look at it in more detail than just making a blanket comment but it is a tough one for Kilkenny there's no doubt about that the games in you know it's back in Turles but Kilkenny like going to Turles and I just feel you know we'll talk maybe a little bit more about the in a minute and we're just talking about the approach here to the game I just think that um, Kilkenny will probably welcome this um, I think they would have uh, they would have liked the extra day um, but I think they'll actually welcome this and they'll welcome playing Limerick as well um, and you know they'll, I think they'll be well prepared for it I think the other thing that's really really important about Kilkenny that will give them a major major boost if it works for them um, certainly Richie Hogan and Colin Fenley coming on last Sunday made a huge difference to their team um, Clearly, they would, they would have been starting if they would have been, if you no, know, if they were fit enough and had enough hurling uh, um, d and that. Um, so the extra, you know, they're not going to be fatigued. These are two players that are very, very important to their team that are coming fresh into it. Maybe with a little bit of a point to prove to Brian Cody and to all Kenny people at this stage. Although they have so many All Ireland medals, it's hard, it's hard to, to to see how that, how that, how, how, why that's so. But maybe, and certainly if those two players come in against Limerick, um, and you know play to the form and play in the actual positions that they were playing last Sunday yeah. Kilkenny could very well come in you know really refreshed and gung-ho about having a go at this um, so you know it, it, because of their past history the recent past history history, their confidence in their team and in their county and hurling um, I think it's less of an issue for Kilkenny Right okay so you'd imagine after the way they played Michael Richie Hogan and uh, Fennelly as well Colin Fennelly is that they're starters so they're yeah. two fresh players I'd say Cody will probably freshen his team up with five new players you know for that played the, that, you know they, they can't go out with similar players that have played grueling matches two weeks in a row but Cheddar does make the point of playing them in their best positions and Richie Hogan I think at his age now coming back from injury playing anywhere other than centre forward isn't probably the best move is it? No like, look they're two lads that come in will you, and they'll be fresh because they haven't played every game or every minute of every game um, Walter's a big Big loss if he can't play. He won't be. A, you can't leave a championship game with a muscle injury and be okay no, six days. No, no, I don't think so. So no. I think like he's a huge loss for Kenny, and I just think it's a step too far uh, for Kenny this week. Limerick, if they bring their energy and the speed that they brought in the league, I don't think Kenny they'll keep up with it for a certain amount of time. But I think they'll struggle towards the end of the game. Um, I read John uh, John Coyle interview during the week, and he just said they're a more mature team. I know they're very young, but he said we've two years experience and two years coaching in these lads. Yeah. And you can see the confidence in them and they won't fear Kilkenny one bit. And also they've learned, I'd say they've learned, they've watched that game against Kilkenny, the two Galway and Kilkenny games. And I think they'll learn more from it because they'll know the high, straight high ball doesn't work. They won't play that. that, that, that that's not their yeah, system. They don't play, play that anyway, anyway no. no. They'll play to, to into space. They've, I think the, the Limerick full forward line will hurt them. 
and if Keane Lynch can get on top in that midfield and distribute the ball the way he has been I, t- I just can't see K- Kenny being able to keep yeah. it done. I'm the same I can't I just can't see how Kenny can win this game mm. not with all the factors um, kind of conspiring against him and what is what team in the country would you not like to play if you're anyway tired than Limerick who work the ball through the lines so you can't you can't yeah. switch off for a second no. and have movement in the forwards better than any other okay. team in the country Cheddar you know what I mean it's not the team that you want to face if you're a little bit tired I, I, I just, there's just a few critical things I think on Sunday um, first of all Limerick didn't play that game against Clare the last day now they may not have been let play it either but they certainly went back to an old Limerick style of, of um, you know up and at him and put the ball up the field yeah. quickly and all maybe of that maybe Shane Dowling tempted them to go that well, bit longer I, 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 no I, I actually think that's the case because you asked me that question uh, uh, the previous week and I didn't think they'd play him because I couldn't see him fitting into that style particularly in that way and I thought uh, Seamus Flanagan was hugely important to the being the receiver of the ball coming into the forwards and of course when you move into the corner that changed all that, that dynamic um, so I, I, and I think also that if if um, and I do agree with Michael if, if Limerick goes straight up the line and knock balls high into it that's the very same as Galway the first day and Galway definitely learned the last day um, so I, I think that's um, I think if Limerick uh, you know played the way they were a little bit earlier on in the year um, I'm also very keen to see him keep mentioning this guy Peter Casey um, he commands us up against Carlo uh, it's difficult to, to rate him you know you wouldn't you wouldn't rate him in, in, in that test they were well ahead at the yeah. time uh, but he's that type of player to play that type of uh, you know, bring the ball up the side, put it across the field in front of the player. You put that to Peter Casey, and he'll hurt you all day. And he's unmarkable with that. You know, he's not similar to Graham McCahey and Aaron Galan in that type of play. So they've a lot of players to play that sort of way. But if they go back again to to just winning the ball in the half back line and keeping the head down and lamp the ball up the field, um, you know, Kilkenny will love that. And again, they'll do like they did in Croke Park the first day: gather in their defence tight, stay tight, work the ball out, and uh, you know they'll, they'll be okay. But I'm 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 I was really amazed by Kenny last Sunday. Um, the the win they won a lot of ball in their defence and they just piled it high down the field on top of Galway on top of Galway and that was I mean Walter Walsh won the first two high balls went in but then when he went off the field and Galway just mopped it up. I mean it doesn't make sense to me to be knocking in high ball into that Galway defence to be yeah. honest with you. But Kenny kept doing it. And it, it, it very much looked like to me that, you know, we've won, and, and, and I, I'm going to qualify what I'm saying here. Here's a team and, and a management that have won an absolute raft of all Ireland's. And, uh, but I'm going to nail my colours to the mast here as well. It looked like um, we're going to stick to our system and we'll find players to fit that system rather than looking at the quality of the players you have and then developing your system to play that. And I thought earlier on in the year I saw Kenny playing um, a good little bit and I thought they had moved yeah. away a little bit yeah. from what they were playing but not last Sunday and it was no surprise to me that you know you're, you have Gerald Elward and, and uh, Forrest like that inside and even the likes of John Donnelly these are not Owen Larkin type players who will contest every single ball at the very least break it and Henry Shefflin and these type of players these are different type players in my view and uh, what I thought really made that really really clear was when Richie Hogan came on the field they moved TJ to wing forward the two of them played right out in the middle of the field right throughout the game so their starting position was almost on that line in the middle of the field and you just saw, saw the damage that they did I mean, I mean th- th- they were unmarkable around that stage and if Richie had had more game time he'd have probably scored maybe six points in that game and they had to move they had to make some you know the goal had to make some moves to try and uh, try and fix that so I'm just surprised that Kenny at the minute that they you know that they just seem to be knocking high balls up the field expecting players to win that type of ball and I mean Walter Welsh was off injured at this stage so they didn't even have that type of ball winner up there <coughs> so I, I think you know, it, I think you'll see changes in both teams. I'll be surprised if you don't. I'll certainly expect to see Limerick going back to you know playing possession, pace, precision type hurling that I saw them playing earlier on in the year. With still with the old Limerick cut about them, they're able to mix it up and they're able to go along if they want to. But I would expect Kilkenny not to just have that one-dimensional dim- play that I saw last Sunday and play into you know. I mean, you have a, you have a tip or a Limerick half back line that are you know tall, strong players as well. Dan Morrissey, Declan Hannan, and, and, and Dermot Byrne are good in the air. You start putting high balls up to them and they win it and they work it back through their midfield. <coughs> and as Michael is saying, if that's a hand pass to Keane Lynch and a thirty-yard uh, hurley pass to Tom Morrissey or Gerard Hergerty and it's a pint from forty or fifty meters, they'll keep knocking them over the same as Galway did last Sunday. They have that quality, so I'll expect to see Kilkenny change the way they play a little bit as well. 
Definitely, won't they? Nick? Yeah, like from 13 years of playing to Kenny, Woolley, it's it, they've only played one way: high ball, and every man wins his own ball. But and you've seen it in the li- league, Cheddar's bang on. Yeah, they tried to play they through the lines. That they, was the talk. They tried to play for a game or two through the lines, and it was successful. But when something's in your DNA, and it's all, the only way you've played for so long, and in the heat of battle and championships, it's a lot different than league. When people are in your face, it's very easy to resort back to the way yeah. you've always played. And I think that's exactly what Kenny done against against Galway. Let's just go back to what we know. And they haven't got the players that they had in the past to play that game. Now, will Limerick put the pressure on that Galway did in their back line and not allow them to look up and find a man through the lines? I think they're fit enough to do that and, and push them up and put loads of pressure on their back line and make them go long and make mistakes. But I'm sure in training this week, Cody's going to be trying to nail them into play short, play the lines and don't play into Limerick's hands. But again, it's in the heat of battle, Bully. You know, it's all they know yeah. in Kenny. They don't play the short game they never have so it's very new to them so yeah and it, even even playing through the lines against Limerick because they're so tigerish in the exactly. back of who that's where yeah. mistakes can happen too I don't know like I think Kilkenny are in a bit of an identity crisis aren't they and even their puck outs cheddar they're all going long and yeah. like you <coughs> just mentioned Limerick half back line I can tell you before this yeah. game even starts that that's probably not the best idea no well, that's what you would think. I mean, e- even the sharp puck out from Owen Murphy went to Paul Murphy and Paul hand-passed it back to Owen and then he went long or Paul went long. Um, you know, so there wasn't enough rehearsing on the next ball. Where does it yeah. go to a next? Where is the player to come off my like, shoulder? Ju- sorry, ju- just to cut you off that, if that's Cork, Spillane and Donahue are Run. so low on that until yeah. someone comes to them and you can yeah. see why they did it. With like Kenny, it's like, give it back and why, yeah. why did you actually do that There's then? no you point know? hitting the ball to a corner back who's going to do the exact same thing as you yeah. really hit the ball eight yards up. It makes no sense to me. Like no. Paul Morby's not the type of player who's going to sprint by a, a corner forward and pass it up the line. They just don't do it. Yeah. Like, so I think yeah. if he's going to go short, it's to a midfielder or half forward or maybe a half back. Uh, uh, and, and Michael, that's the real interesting one. And here's the real crux, I think, for Limerick um, next Sunday. Um, Richie Hogan and TJ Reid are going to play outfield. They'll, they'll just actually stand out there. So they're ideal made then for that type of ball. You know, uh, um, even a puck out going to Paul Murphy, he makes 10 metres. He's, he's a 30 metre hurley pass then to Richie Hogan. Richie Hogan and TJ Reid will score from distance every single time. I know Richie missed a couple last Sunday, but, but he's a very accurate player. Whereas you look at the the um, Limerick half forward line, Garrod, Hegarty, Kyle Hayes, Tom Morrissey, do they don't have that yet. They may have in time. Right. Um, so so what do Limerick do? Do Declan Hannan and Dermot Byrne then step up the field on their men? They can't do that because they're leaving a hole behind them when they do that. So who's now going to step back? Are you asking Keane Lynch then to forsake some of his his uh, distribution game in the middle of the field to keep an eye on on these players out there? Um, so th- it's it's on those things I think the team's go- the game's going to really hinge. What can any teams out there? How do they play? And can Limerick b- force their they are passing game on Kilkenny in doing that. I think that game, the game's going to hinge on that. One other little thing that's interesting, I think, Michael, you mentioned it there, that Limerick won't fear them. And there's a little bit of truth in that um, because, you know, in an under-21 final, was it last year, the year before, the hockey Kilkenny Beat them well, in, in an under-21 final. And this is, the, you know, this is really is the basis of that under-21 team and the Limerick team. So they may very well be high on confidence against Kilkenny. Yeah, they might have. Uh, like, I mean, when, when you look at it in Nolan Park last year, it was 20 points to 17. <coughs> Limerick pushed them all the way. And yeah. Limerick have improved an awful lot from last year. Like, last year they were dismal against Clare, yeah. you know, and then have to go up to Nolan Park. I was amazed they got so close to Kilkenny actually last year. But this is a completely different Limerick team. Like, this is a much better Limerick team. Absolutely. You'd say Limerick teams have passed their moral victories, you know, or we played well. Like, I don't think this team would be happy to be beaten by a point by anybody, you know, and oh, we pushed them, we played really well. They're all about winning this team, you know, and. They're young lads, they're hungry for it. Well, and I just think, like, I, I, any any other result bar a Limerick win would really surprise me with this team coming in on yeah. Sunday, you know? So. No, exactly. And uh, no, I do take your point, like, when TJ can go Roman, that's fine. But if TJ and Richie go Roman, like, I mean, that's a different ball game. You can't leave two of them there. And then if the wing back, say, Morrissey follows TJ, is Colin Fenley getting all that space to run out into then? So there is. That's you see, but are Kilkenny tactically clever enough to actually think like that, Cheddar? Or, you know, I, I don't know. Well, you know, you're a fair man to make a statement <laughs> like that, is all I'll say to you. Um, I don't. Look, I'm asking uh, you a really difficult no. question yeah, there. No, like, you are. No, I, I think, you know, you kind of switch that on in the day. You've got to rehearse, rehearse it. And Michael is right. Um, you know, you probably even in a year, you probably need a couple of years to really rehearse that down to such a fine art that everybody is, what you're really looking at there is clear understanding between all players of what's going to happen before it happens. Really, that's what you're looking at. Um, and you need to rehearse an, that an awful lot. Um, 
So, but I do think that Kenny have the ability to switch that on because of their confidence to try things and because they have that confidence built up the bank from, you know, winning an awful lot over the last couple of years. If that was another team, I'd say no. Um, there's one other little thing that is a small little bit worrying though. Limerick seem to be switching around their full back line now again. Yeah. I think they started, yeah. think they started yeah. off the last day with Richie McCarthy and Mike Casey who were two full backs <coughs> on, the, on the full back line. Um, and that's fine um, if you were playing three on three inside, but if Kenny go two quick players inside and Jerry Elward and uh, Colin Fenley and they pull Mike Casey out the field or something like that. And now, yeah. we're, now we're in different territory altogether. So I would expect Kilkenny to look at this uh, certainly in a m- much more structured way than I've seen for the last two Sundays. And, and that if that happens and, um, you know, they, 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 they gain they gain ground doing that. Um, I, I'm going to go against the trend here, lads. And even though I've backed Kilkenny and I've uh, backed Limerick, a lot earlier on the year I saw, I saw them as really an emerging team here with a really good structure of play and that um, but I, I think um, if Richie Hogan and TJ Reid play in the positions that they finished in last Sunday and that they have and Colin Fennelly and that they have the gas in the tank to be able to finish the game strong those three players in particular I'm going to say that Kenny are going to win this match and I'll probably be the only person here that will say that but I just think that they'll have a, a psychological edge coming out of Turles last Sunday with the way they finished up. They were nearly being hammered out of sight and yet they, they had two real goals after the All-Ireland Champions in our view the best team in Ireland at the minute. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go against you here lads and I'm going to say I think that Kenny may very well pull off this game. Alright okay that's an interesting one. Just on the full back line there have been changing their full back mm. a few times but Finn went off injured against Clare and that's when your man Condon came on Cheddar for not too long and Finn came back on against Carlos so maybe he's only getting himself back in after injury because yeah. it is Finn and English are, seem to be their two yeah. preferred cornerbacks but and it's the full back seems to be going between Casey and Picky and, McC- okay. and, uh, and I, was, I was impressed with Finn earlier on in, yeah. in the year he's certainly the type of player that you will need at this stage of the championships you know quickness to be able to gobble up ball and make round and all of that's the type of player you want here um, so look if he is in full back or is he an in cornerback with Richie English and whether you have Mike Casey or whether you're Richie McCarthy full back both are the same type of players they really go for the ball and the other two will mop up behind them yeah. then I think, they're, I think they're much safer I yeah, think Richie McCarthy might struggle for pace on Fenley that would be my only worry I'd probably put Casey in if it was myself there but just he's more mobile yeah. Richie McCarthy's an excellent full back around the space but just mobility wise yeah Richie McCarthy might need to start doing blending his food <laughs> and to get you're <laughs> a man he's a, he's, a tro- he's a real <laughs> throwback isn't yeah, he it's yeah. like that man's not fit there is no way he's properly fit well, he uh, know, doesn't I know, seem I get skinned no much, he doesn't no, look, look, I'm going to come in here strongly. He's an all-star, isn't he? No, I'm going to come no. in here strongly against that. Yeah, well, no, he's an all-star. Um, I think he is, yeah. Y- you've got to really know the players. Um, y- it may very well be that what you're seeing is not the case here at all. R- Richie M- McCarthy's body comp could be, could be, I don't know, 7 or 8% body fat or whatever it is. You don't know it. Yeah. And just because he looks like that, um, you know, I, and I've experienced with some players like that that were fastidious about, you know, what to e- eat and all of that. And they were savage trainers. But just that was their body build. That was their DNA as such. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I know there's a little bit of fun about Richie and that. And, and I know Limerick supporters love him because of his gung-ho way of hurling about that. Uh, but I'd be slow to comment on things like that until you really, really know the, the, the players themselves. Yeah, stop making me feel bad now, Cheddar, right? You're making me feel like a horrible person here, right? <laughs> Up next, we'll do Paddy Power predictions and we'll, look, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Clare and Wexford. <laughs> All right, just quickly, Michael, we'll get a prediction off you for Limerick and Kilkenny. I think I know which way you're going anyway. Cheddar's given his. He's going for Kilkenny. Yeah, I'll disagree. I'm going to go for Limerick, Willie. I think the last two weeks are going to take his toll on Kilkenny. And if Limerick bring the energy and, and speed at the pace that they brought throughout the league, they'll do damage. Yeah, OK. For what it's worth, I think Limerick um, are a great... Uh, uh, bet this weekend as well right up next lads is Clare and Wexford and we know this is called the Davy Derby and all eyes will be on Davy Fitz and Davy Fitz didn't want to talk about it last week because anything that he would say would be blown up and he's dead right so he didn't really say anything about it so like I'm wondering who has the advantage here Cheddar the players know Davy well they know what tricks he likes D- Davy has been consistent with UL I talked to Owen Kelly about him a few years ago with his tactics and then I start looking at Clare and everything Owen said to me about what UL like to do, especially in the forwards, I could see them doing it with Clare. And the Clare players will know all his little moves and his fallback moves. Davy will know all the Clare players really well, but Clare playing a completely different system now to when Davy was there. So it would it be slightly advantage Clare? Um, first of all, I, I think the 
the Davy factor that has nothing to do with it at all. To be honest with you, Willie, um, I think you know. So what we're if we're saying that we're saying that you know Davy's going to be hyped up about this against Clare, and if you say that, then you're saying that Clare that Davy is not properly hyped up in the previous match and so on, so on. Um, you know, Davy is probably one. He's he's certainly one of the top managers around. He's consistent in performance and how he prepares for teams against all teams, regardless of whether it's Clare or whoever it is. Um, so I don't think it's a huge factor. Um, I, I do agree with you to one extent. Um, obviously, Wexford play with a sweeper. Now, they play a little bit different in the way they play the sweeper than, than Clare played. Um, and obviously, for the last number of years, Clare have been practicing that in internal practice games. So they know who picks up what and they know when to break and when to hand over players and all of that. And that is an advantage. I do agree with you on that. Um, but I, I think. I, I just think that you know that's probably counterbalanced by Davy knowing a lot about you know individual technical things about the Clare players, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, you may very well have uh, Peter Duggan who has a good air game, um, and you know your 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 pos- position and your stance on the dropping ball and that, and you know Michael has explained earlier on what arm you would tackle. You may actually change your body position to the other se- side and maybe just slap the hand and put the ball to the floor. That type of information in a close game like this is very, very important. So I, I think it just balances out, to be honest with you. Claire will be used to how to set up to be able to take on a, a, a sweeper and, and stop that ball coming out of the defence and negate the sweeper, first of all. Don't get him into the play. And if the, if the Wexford do win the ball in the defence, how your tackling game is going to shut that down. On the opposite side, I think Wexford, I think Davy will know a lot technically about some players. For example, it was very, very clear with John, with John Conlon the last day that he is he wants the ball off his left shoulder because he's used to playing as a, as a right half forward. Um, so look, if I'd be surprised if Clare played the same way where to clear that corner, or it's probably normally called that, clear the corner and put the ball in there, um, that if, if Wexford were to leave that open, certainly the sweeper will be sort of veering over towards yeah. that and blocking out the space. Um, so I think, look, you, you asked me a question, I think it's sort of, sort of 50-50 really. Both of them know a good bit about one another. But um, in terms of your initial um, reference to the Davy factor, I don't think that's a real factor in it at all, to be honest with you, because I think you know Davy and the Clare management team will be preparing their game for, ev- for their team for every game to the very very same um, you know high level as such, and they certainly won't try to improve it any more in games like this. Yeah. So Mur- Murphy will go back as a sweeper. We know that for Wexford and Clare will obviously try and free up Shanahan maybe as the sweeper because he did so well against mm-hmm. Limerick in that role now he wasn't great against uh, Cork the last day but the way Clare were doing it it was hard to free him up like they dropped yeah. Reedy back on Mead and then they were trying to get one of their backs free so it was, there was a lot of jumbling around yeah. to get a sweeper free against Cork they'll be given it against uh, Wexford so mm-hmm. they'll be able to plan an awful lot better of who their man is and what your role is uh, Michael yeah, oh, look, there's it's a, it's a game you could easily overanalyze. There's so many permutations on who's going to mark who. And uh, uh, John Conlon, the careful forward line is the winning of the game for me. Like, um, po- you have the podge factor. Does a cornerback go with podge? You ca- I don't think you can let him go between the lines and just let him run free and stay in the corner. But then if you're taking a man out, you're leaving John Conlon and Shane O'Donnell in there who are two unbelievable yeah, but Murphy will cover them right yeah but the only way you beat him is either over the top and let John Conlon catch it if he does, if Liam Ryan doesn't manage to break a ball the spare man doesn't matter yeah or the ball's right to the corner which Shane O'Donnell will love you know so um, like Liam Ryan's a very good hurler but he will struggle one on one with Conlon on high balls he's just he's so informed at the moment and the way like we've seen Clare hurl so well in the first half against Cork but once Cork pushed up and stopped that good ball going into John Conlon Claire lost it so yeah. like Davey it seemed to be their only plan really yeah, didn't so it yeah Davey's going to watch that and know like and, and put huge emphasis on not that not allowing great ball going into that full forward line will he, you know yeah. so I think Davey is at a bit of an advantage so you've got to watch that game and really analyse it and see what how Cork went about winning it for the same time I think Claire, Claire just have a few more better hurlers than Claire right. to, to to, to, to get over it, the yeah. line can you see a situation Cheddar where for example Peter Duggan probably wouldn't have that work rate to be following O'Keefe or Foley up the field all the time that you'd put Connell and Duggan maybe inside like I mean do Clare have to, because Dave is so meticulous and he is a great tactician like that's Davy's strength he's brilliant at it that Clare can simply cannot go with the same game plan as the last time because Davy will have a plan for that they have to maybe throw maybe some something left field that Davy has to stop and think about um, it would be help, very healthy if you could, but you need the players to do that, Willie, obviously. Um, and I think, you know, Clare management are in a little bit of a sticky wicket here because 
um, Wexford have a lot of really good matchups on the key Clare players. And you know, you mentioned Peter Duggan, Paddy Foley. Um, in in the air would be strong enough for Peter Duggan, <laughs> and he's also a very very quick player. And Peter yeah. Duggan may very well want to be tracking Paddy Foley up the field from scoring yeah. long range points. On the other side, I, I, I'd imagine Clare use Reedy. Reedy um, be perfect for O'Keefe, no? He, well, look, isn't O'Keefe fairly perfect for Reedy? Yeah, well, that's look true. The other okay. way. But I'd imagine that Clare uh, use Reedy to create a lot, a lot of space around that area for to be able for Tony Kelly to be able to punch holes in in your defence and that. Um, and obviously, you know, Podge is out there as well, and they're they're very aware of space and how to make space and all of that for for one another. Uh, but I'll go back to uh, Michael's point. Like Liam Ryan is a, an established full back and again a very very tall player as such. And and uh, look, that'll be a great battle. Mm. But if Liam Ryan gets a better at John Conlon a full forward, um, you know it's hard. And I you know Damien Reck and some of these younger Wexford hurlers Don't now know. are quick hurlers. Don't know they're quick hurlers, and and uh, you know they may very well start to play from the front and the likes of Conor McGrath. And that's the beauty, really, about that. Sorry, that's one of the advantages about playing a sweeper. You can go man to man because you have somebody to cover the space and to mop up the ball that's being put in there. Um, and like, if you can do that and w- often enough against the opposition, eventually you're just going to break them and you're going to force them to do something else. And you know, our player going to move John Conlon then to the other wing forward to try and go along to the half hour line and score from range from there. Um, so I, I think it's also an interesting game. I think the other interesting thing about it is uh, Tony Kelly at centre forward and you might say that Matt Joe Hanlon isn't the right fit for Tony Kelly but uh, Tony Kelly n- n- you know it's similar to, to Hogan spends a lot of his time out in the middle of the field so you as a centre back can't go out there anyway so in a sense um, you know Tony Kelly might be better off in this game not playing as far out but actually yeah. playing from the full forward line out the midfield rather than from the centre forward back to back to the half his own half back line and try and force Matt Joe Hanlon to, to mark him but equally you're dragging him out of position and you're making that space in a different way so I think Clare will be looking at a lot of that making space in, 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 in a sort of different way than against Cork at top's a little bit one dimensional I expected more from them to be honest with you and I think um, I agree with Michael once Cork Cork went man to man in the first half um, and when you do that you allow the space to create it if you don't have a sweeper they went to, to, to their play positions in the second half and they rearranged their team and they attacked the ball and when they did that Clare didn't seem to have you know pl- plan B nor did they have the leadership on the field um, to, to really figure this out and, and, and to do something about it yeah. um, so uh, no more than the other game um, to be honest with you it's a very very close game to call I think you know Davy has been in Wexford, um, obviously for the time he's there now, and you know second year, first year you're sort of finding your feet, you're getting to know the players, you're getting to know the players that you can rely on to play the way you want to play. This is year two, and you know Davy himself will expect to be able to step up, and um, you know this is knockout now. This this is there's no more parachutes here now for any team, um, so you've got to step up and and go win the game. I think it'll be quite close, um, but you'd probably say that you know Clare on forum this year have played some better hurling than Wexford and Wexford have been a small little bit hit and miss and I've said this a number of times this year that they're a little bit inconsistent against the top teams they might play very well for 20-30 minutes and then they seem to fade out of the game and some of the games I mean the game against Kenny is a case in point here they were, they were 8 or 9 points up they should have just choked them out of the game and they didn't they let them back into it and they, they have a little bit of a history of doing that taking their foot off the gas at critical times in the match and then allowing the other team back into it and not being able to turn it over themselves if that's the case and Clare get a running game at them then then I think Clare will win the match but I think it will be very close yeah I think you make a great point on Tony Kelly there because you're right if he goes back too far against Wexford that's a mistake because Nolan or O'Connor or someone yeah. will pick yeah. him up so he's not getting free there and what he's actually doing is just giving the Matthew Hanlon that holding role yeah. so Tony Kelly needs to use his head like because he does have that tendency and when you see him live at the Munster final he's way back yeah. he's and Davey, way too far back and Davy Fitz has managed, managed Tony Kelly for and years and he know that well he's yeah. really yeah. taught him most of, most of his space management on, in a, in, on a pitch woolly so like, does Jerry O'Connor throw a spanner in the works and just change his team completely because he knows it so well? I don't think so because what they've been doing, they've done an awful lot of things well. You know, they did get caught against in the second half against Cork. I'd probably put Tony Kelly midfield. I think it's harder to man mark a, a man around the middle and he might find more space there. Um, Matthew O'Hanlon won't like chasing him around the place. You know, he won't like that. But yeah. will they be able to find him? It's going to be very tight and compact in that back line for Wexford, you know. So the space isn't going to be there to find, which makes it Tony Kelly go out the pitch. And that 
that's walking into the hands of Wexford as well, you know. So, but if he dropped to midfield, and got that pop pass like the Limerick lad yeah. for. But th- the problem with Tony is he goes that little goes, bit too far. Yeah. So he's not he's the one almost giving that pop pass yeah, instead of the one receiving the shoot then as well. Yeah. You know, so and then you're just giving the ball back into where there's going to be Sean Murphy's going to be right in front front of a full back line, and he won't be there to back it up then. You know, so it's going to be tough. He's going to have to be disciplined and he's going to have to stay forward up the pitch. Yeah. Do you not see the point on Peter Duggan putting him in the full forward line though? Because yeah. the two Wexford cornerbacks are small and if you have Conlon and him in there, there's a definite kind of advantage there. So if Ryan, Ryan could easily pick up Duggan or mm. pick up Duggan because he's so good in the air and then you've got Conlon and one of the two cornerbacks yeah. where you'd see an, an, like a, a, an advantage there, Cheddar, no? I, I think, um, you know, I think Peter Duggan's Best because I mean you need ball winners in the half hour line as well. You know, yeah. if you don't have ball winners in the half hour line because sometimes your defence is under such pressure that you know you, you, you are clearing off the back foot a lot of the time and that ball is landing in the half hour line and look you can't have that coming back down your throat again. So so you do need uh, um, some some uh, physical uh, players there. But I, I think the the when Wexford turn over ball having two defenders free or you know broadly free on your half back line to work it out is seriously dangerous when you have Dermot O'Keefe and Paddy Foley available to shoot long range points because the, that's the best way to, tr- to to kill the sweeper you score long range points you go 8-1 up and the opposition management now is under pressure do we need to move our player up the field because clearly what we're doing we're going to get better out the gate here before it's, before it's too late and and uh, you know they're the start of the dynamics that happen in the early stages of matches that if you can get a toehold in the game and make it work for you you can force the opposition to move away from the game their preferred game plan and generally speaking when you do that you can keep them on the run that's the problem I have at Wexford they've seemed to have done that fairly regular have had the game by the scruff of the neck and just haven't closed it out yeah what are they missing then Wexford for making the step up obviously Rory O'Connor will come back into that forward mm. line is their system here's a little theory of mine in that Wexford played that defensive system when Davy took over to get up to that level yeah. but now that Rory O'Connor comes into the team Lee, Go- Lee Mo McGovern's there Connor McDonald's there Lee Chin is there do they really need that sweeper now because I often find when they ha- play that sweeper it affects their own forward line and can their own forward line not it's almost like the y- people used to say about Waterford that do Waterford with the players they had at the start they might have needed that to get to a level but maybe do they need to say right we can actually match that team man for man now yeah I just don't think they were getting the consistency out of them forwards that you mentioned Willie so they relied so much on Dermot O'Keefe and Paddy Foy to be sprinting up both lines teams caught on to that pretty quickly I think David Reedy and Pierre Duggan have the fitness to keep going with them and go back so they're not going to be a big of, as big of influence I don't think this weekend Roy O'Connor has been a huge find he's been brilliant all year and I think him and McInerney are going to have a huge battle if, if he goes in full forward and Lee Chain has been disappointing in the championship so far Like he's, he started the league on fire and no one could stop him I think he he's due a huge game so I think, I think it's going to be interesting we haven't mentioned him much at all I think yeah. he, he's going to have a huge influence in this game this weekend because he, he normally steps up in the biggest games in yeah. championship they have a lot of match winners now Wexford on paper Absolutely. now like I take your point on Chin in the championship yeah. hasn't been at his best but like Wexford have are Wexford the team that need the defensive game plan Cheddar or is Murphy just so good at that sweeping system that they'd be stupid to, to give it up? I don't think they'd be foolish to give it up now, uh, Molly, if that's the way they've been playing all along, unless they've been rehearsing a different system or something like that. But I'm going to go back, back, back to the question that you asked, and I'm going to answer it very, very quickly. Efficient scoring forwards. And you, if Wexford had uh, even John McGrath, who, whose um, percentage scores from shots taken are very, very high, in very little space in very tight space they'd be a serious serious team right. and, and that's the one thing that they're, they've, they've a lot of things they're certainly building and they're certainly in, their un, in the right place to win an All-Ireland in my view and that's a fair statement for me to make but I will make that statement but they probably do need at least one or maybe two um, a real efficient scoring forward and if you look at some of the teams that we've been praising uh, recently whether that's Cork with, 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 with uh, Pat Horgan um, you know you would take one or two of those players out of those teams and it would be very same to be very industrious and there'd be an awful lot of work going on but those efficient points that you need in you know in the shoebox in a confessional they yeah. need to be able to score with that level of space and, and Wexford need probably one of those forwards at the minute and ideally maybe two and if there were I think you'd be look, then looking at a, you know, a serious serious team here yeah maybe this hoped uh, Conor McDonald would be that player but like I mean like uh, the one thing I took away from the Munster final was that every time Patrick Horgan got the ball in his hand 
you didn't see anything other than the no. score. Like there no. was actually no way he could be stopped scoring because he was able to throw it back the other way yeah. and d- almost unnaturally get power yeah. from throwing it away from the defender. So maybe maybe they do need that type of player. Right, lads, we'll get uh, predictions off you here now. Um, so Cheddar, I'll go to you first. I'll just get the Paddy Power odds here now. Go on, work away. Um, uh, look, I, I, I think um, the match in Park Kiev is at three thirty on a Saturday. Um, sorry, Willie, I wanted to make minor comment about oh, last Sunday there. Um, we had two teams that went at it hammer and tongs in Thurles last Sunday haven't played the previous Sunday and they were going as hard at the finish as they were at the start probably even more so and I, I think the players deserve massive credit for the entertainment that they gave last Sunday but you know we talk about um, you know conditioning and, and um, you know professionalism and looking at soccer teams and all of that who most of the time walk around the field here's two teams that went at one another and they were going as strong as the end and, and I'd really like to compliment both teams the, and particularly the condition that they were in yeah I'm going to go back to your back to your question no, um, but just just before we go to predictions, uh, we actually it was went up to Port Leash training the other night, and the training was at half seven. I remember just saying to someone, "How the hell did these teams play at three o'clock in the day yeah. and play at that intensity yeah. level when you're sweating just kicking a ball around yeah. before training starts?" Like they they do deserve the yeah. cre- unbelievable credit to serve that up at yeah. three o'clock in the day. Right, go on, Cheddar. Uh, all right, yeah. Well, the odds here for Clare, Clare two to five favourites for this and Wexford are 5-2 to two. we didn't mention the odds in the Kilkenny Limerick game because it's actually practically even money it's 11-10 to 10 and 10-11 to 11. so that's why we're all sp- that's why we're all split on that one this one is a little bit leaning towards Clare here Cheddar yeah and I'd probably be the same myself um, but, but, but look there's really really nothing in this I could make a, a, you know, a very very strong case for Wexford obviously as well um, I think Clare will be disappointed with the Munster Championship uh, with the Munster Final and they're certainly their second half performance now they, they, were, they were very good in the first half if they continue that type of play of course very dependent on the system that they play in that and if they can continue like that and get an edge in Wexford um, I can see them winning the game um, but sometimes you like you no, know, Clare won an All Ireland in twenty thirteen, and they they didn't they haven't won a Munster Championship, didn't win it that year either, haven't won a Munster Champ for twenty years, and sometimes that can bring in a little bit of doubt into the dressing room. Do you know what they seem to put a lot of um, emphasis on winning the Munster Championship this year? Definitely got a clear public behind them and, and all of that, and sometimes that knockback can really hurt your team and you know knock the wind out of you as such. And you yeah. come in the following day, then even though you've had a break and you've all the right things done and all of that, but you just don't have the same energy and vim about you in the dressing room and going out in the field and that. Um, it's, it, there was one other thing about that that I was surprised at. You when we talk about nutrition and, and here's here's the edges you're looking at. The day of the Munster final, Clare done a very aggressive warm up in scorching heat, certainly much more than Cork did. And uh, sometimes, you know, you will always have your warm up down to the f- down to the last puck of a ball, exactly what you're to do. That'll be pre planned so much. Every player knows what he's to do in the warm up, and and, and that means everything. Where he stands in the photograph and all of that is pre planned. But sometimes you've got to change tack and it was so warm that day you know i'm not so sure that doing a real aggressive warm-up in a situation like that um you know was what was going was going was was helpful i don't know and again i'm not qualified in that area i'd be, I'd be certainly listening to snc people in that area anyway back to your your your, your question this is my third time to try and answer this <laughs> <laughs> um look I, I, trying I, to avoid I, this prediction I, isn't yeah, he I, I, I just think that um if claire um, you know, get over the psychological um, kick that they got in the Munster final, particularly the way they gave away that game. And they're up for this game again with the same level of energy and passion. And the Clare crowd come to the game and to support them. I think Clare just will have a small bit too much for Wexford. Right. Okay, Michael. I per, just for me, I'll just go just to yeah. be contrary. I'll go Wexford. Right. I think that if they can go to Nolan Park and perform like they did, well, I know they went out of it, but. I think they can. I think uh, Wexford can be clear, but anyways, that's neither here nor there. You're just trying to get in Davies' good, <laughs> good side for once. Did you, would you believe? Imagine. Like, I thought you fell out with yeah. 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 <laughs> But like, I mean, I've often been told like I might not tip a team to win, and yeah. just people get the hump. It's like you've yeah. something against the team yeah. that you don't, where you're actually just trying to predict who's going to win the game. Yeah. There's nothing better. Yeah. Yeah. Like, How can there be anything personal in it? You're no. not saying you hope they win. No, you're saying exactly. you think they win. It's a very anyways, tough one to call this one. Um, I think it is. It's a lot closer than five to two. I think, isn't it? Five. The, the odds there. I'd see this no more Definitely. than a little bit like Kilkenny Limerick close to yeah. even money I'm going on Clare only for the simple fact of the way Wexford play Willie they, they're a very hard team to break down and, and they're not going to be huge winning margin for either side but the way they play is also playing against them that they won't score much they, they're they not a very high scoring team because of the way they play it's difficult yeah. for forwards to, play, to, to, to have that fitness and movement all the time you know so 
I just think Clare would be more relentless in attack and eventually they'll break through and, and score, overscore. Yeah, okay. So I think so I'm going for Clare. You're both, both you're going for Clare and going for Wexford. All right, so that's two for Clare and I'm going with Wexford. Right, lads, we'll leave it there. That's all we have time for. We'll be back on Monday as usual with a review show. All right, good luck. <laughs>